الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وأسك الله سبحانه وتعالى that he shows us the sirat al-mustaqim and that he keeps his steadfast upon it likewise we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he protects us from all forms of deviation upon each path the head of it there is a shaitan so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for that steadfastness because we need his assistance in it and we cannot guide ourselves this is the second last lesson where we are looking at the book Iqtidat Sirat Mustaqim of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah and in today's lesson we are going to look at as he says Faslun the chapter Fi Sa'il al-A'yad wal Mawasim al-Mubtadi'ah festivals and the uh, times of seasons and days that have been allocate, allocated by the people of Bid'ah I want to go in the class huh? I want to go I am going okay that's fine Okay. So we have looked at in the previous uh, chapters the ruling on attending the festivals of the people who are celebrating religious symbols and identities and beliefs of other religions. And we looked at the ruling on venerating those days, uh, congratulating one another and greetings on those days and sharing gifts and attending celebrations. Now the question is, does the same ruling apply for innovative festivals? And there are many examples of innovative festivals, such as celebrating the Prophet's birthday, such as certain days that people hold in veneration in the month of Rajab, which there is no delil for, such as venerating certain days in Muharram, as the Shia and the Rawafid do, such as holding certain days in Sha'ban, as we will see, as the Shaykh will explain. If there is no evidence for it, and holding that day repeated every single month or year or week or whatever it may be, because we talked about what Eid is, Eid is something which is repeated. So the author is saying here, Fisa'ir al Ayyad. Ayyad is the plural of Eid. Something which is repeated every single cycle. If there is no evidence for venerating that day, what is the ruling on that? Because we talked about other religions not allowed to attend, etc. But this is within Islam. Is there leeway in it? Is it issue of ishtihad? Is it that you know we should all get along? And the Sheikh has made it clear in this chapter that everything that we have talked about when it comes to attending innovated, sorry, when it comes to attending festivals which are haram, which are found outside of Islam, they apply to innovated festivals which are found within Islam that Muslims are doing. So venerating days which are innovated, haram. The same principle applies. Greetings based on those days, haram. Same principles apply. Exchanging gifts, attending celebrations, all of this. In actual fact, the ulama have said when it comes within Islam, you should even be stricter. Because remember last session we said that if there is a maslaha, if there is a greater good in ex- accepting the gift that the person gives to you during the season of their celebrations, not because of a ritual that they have practiced, but just generally they want to give you a gift at that time, then you are allowed to accept it. But the ulama are saying here that those people who are innovating and innovated, the Muslim should be stricter with it. So here we have a narration from Anas bin Malik. A group of people, they came to Anas bin Malik and they said to him, Anas bin Malik, famous companion of the Messenger of Allah, Khadim Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they asked him, there are a group of people that reject the shafa'ah, the intercession of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, Yawm al-Qiyamah, and they reject the adab of qabr, the, the punishment of the grave. What should we do with them? Anas bin Malik said, Ula'ik al these people are liars, these people are innovators, they are astray. Fala tujalisuhum, do not sit with them, meaning complete boycott. 
Ibn Abbas, there are many narrations for the companions, but here's a direct one. Ibn Abbas, he says, La tujalis ahl al ahwa, do not associate yourselves with the people of innovation, do not sit with them, do not accompany them, do not support them. For inna mujalasitum mumurrida lil kulub. If you sit with them, it will cause a disease to enter into your heart. It will cause your heart to become hard. And then hidayah will not penetrate. The Qur'an will not penetrate. The sunnah will not penetrate. Other things will become your benchmark. And you can see that for yourselves. If you go to other places, places of innovation, they are not concerned about the Qur'an and the sunnah. They are not concerned about the salaf of the ummah. They are more concerned in singing songs or what their their religious leader has said, or what is cultural Islam, etc. So Ibn Abbas got it spot on. He said, if you sit with these people, that hardness will penetrate and you will adopt the same methodology. Therefore the ulama have said, when it comes to the people of innovation, there must be a boycott from the people of Sunnah towards the people of innovation. So if they've got religious days and celebrations and they're venerating certain moments in the year which have no evidence for them, then there should be a boycott. And this is what we have found from the narrations of the companions. And here we have some examples in the books of fiqh also. So, for example, Umar al-Khattab, the Islamic Empire had spread. And now underneath Islamic jurisdiction, you had Christians and you had Jews who were, well, Jews didn't do this, but now the Christians were trading pork and alcohol. At the time of the Messenger of Allah, there were Jews there in Medina and surrounding Medina. This is something new at the time of Umar. Are we allowed to let the Christians trade alcohol and pork? Umar permitted it. But he forbade it for Muslims to do it. See, now we are looking at a practical example from the books of fiqh where you would allow for certain leniences and concessions with the kuffar but when it comes to the Muslims you must be harsh because they are either deviating or falling into something which is haram another example in the books of fiqh the ulama have said that you are allowed to have a non-Muslim business partner in your transactions as long as you know that that person is trustworthy but if there is a Muslim who's mixed up his wealth with halal and haram, the ulama have said it's makruh. See now is a practical example again. That with the non-Muslim, you're bringing him closer to Islam. You're showing concession and lenience with him. But when it comes to the Muslim, you know that he's got some haram involved. It becomes disliked to eat from his food and drink from his drink and to get into business transactions with him. Another example that the ulama have said Are you allowed to trade with a Muslim who is sinful? Or should you give precedence to a non-Muslim? For example, you want to go buy something from the grocery store And this Muslim sells cigarettes and maybe lottery tickets Non-Muslim down the road does the same thing who do you give precedence to? Now a lot of people will say, I'll give my business to a Muslim. Yeah, I know he's got some sins, etc. Some of the Maliki, they have said, boycott that Muslim. Because you are assisting him in his trade, even though it's not direct. But by boycotting him, hopefully he can see where he is going wrong. And there is a Fatna and Lajna Daima where they have said something similar. Look for somebody who is more practicing, who is not doing something which is haram, but otherwise... So now the point that we're making here is not to attack anyone or offend anyone but just to show you that the religion of Islam is saying here look, when it comes to religious festivals of the kuffar majority of the ulama said you can't get involved there can be no greeting, there can be no exchange of gifts etc. Ibn Taymiyyah and like we said this is probably the most pragmatic and practical uh, scholarly view for us here in the West living as a minority that you can accept gifts if there is a betterment on the conditions that we mentioned before. But when it comes to the Muslims, the purpose of you not attending is not so that you can offend them. It's not that so that you can rub them up the wrong way. 
It's not so that you can get into an argument about them. When was the Prophet born? Do we have a uh, Eid and a celebration for his birthday, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and then create aggravation? That's not the purpose. The purpose, as we have seen from these narrations from the companions of the ulama, have mentioned Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah explains, Ali ibn Taymiyyah and the ulama from the contemporary ulama, they said boycott the people of innovation so that they can see where they have gone wrong. You advise them and you say, listen, I'm not going to get involved in something like this because this is against the Quran and the Sunnah and understanding of the Salaf. And by doing that, hopefully, it will have some kind of nasiha towards them, some kind of advice towards them. And here, like we have said, we have given some examples in the books of fiqh, which are practical examples also, in showing that there is a distinction sometimes in the way that we deal with the kuffar and we deal with innovators and innovated practices in Islam. So Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, says, فَأَيَادْ أَهْلُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْأَعْجَامِ نُهِيَ أَنْهَا لِسَبَبَيْنِ He said here that the festivals of the kuffar, we are not allowed to attend them, we talked about this before, and the festivals which are innovated are not allowed for two reasons. So now he is saying here, all festivals which have no dalil for it, is not permissible for the Muslim to get involved with them and to celebrate and to attend and to exchange gifts and to greet and to recognize. Lisaba Bain, he says, for two reasons. Number one, because it involves imitation. Birthdays involve imitation. Valentines involve imitation. Celebrating New Year's involves imitation. All of this has some kind of either kufr or shirk or something which is a major sin involved. وَقَوْنُهَا مِنَ الْبِدْعَ And he says also people have introduced these festivals, even in those religions, most of the time because, and he's talked about this in detail before, most of the time because it is an innovation into their own religion. Isa ibn Maryam didn't say celebrate my birthday. He didn't even say he had a birthday. So where did they get the 25th of December from? And this is an example. So Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah is saying here, we have two Eids. That is because those two Eids is number one, our identity, and number two, this is the Haq. Everything besides that is not the Haq. And by contrast to that, and look at the opposite of that, is that when you engage yourselves in festivals which are not legislated, you are imitating those people who are following something which is not legislated. And this is haram. And you are getting involved with things which have no precedence in the religion of Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not pleased with. Now the Shaykh points out, and this is a very important part of the book, and it's a very important paragraph, because some people will say, at the time of Milad, and you will find this probably in your WhatsApp messages and your social media, etc. Ibn Taymiyyah approved of celebrating the Prophet's birthday. And they might even get a clip or a paragraph from this book. Obviously, it's taken out of context. But the Shaykh brings out a very important mas'ala, which is, say you've got a person, he is sincere, but he falls into error or he falls into innovation. Will he still be rewarded? Imagine you were doing something, you were genu- genuinely thought that this is, this is the religion of Allah, and you did it out of ikhlas. All of this time, it's been innovated. Will you be rewarded or not? You will be rewarded. Why? So you will be rewarded for your intention. You can't say, well, Allah knows what's... That, 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 that opens up a whole different kind of words with the Morija and ahl I know what you're saying. What the Shaykh is saying here is that you having intention to do a good deed is an action in itself. It's an action of the heart. It's an act of worship of the heart. Ikhlas. You will be rewarded for that. As for the action, then it will not be accepted. And this is the fairness of the Shaykh. Look, at, look how fair he is. It's very easy for him to say anybody who is against... Salafis, Ahlul Sunnah, etc. We reject them and we refute them. The Shaykh is saying here, no, let's be fair. That if a person, your niya is an act of worship, and if you did that for the sake of Allah, perhaps you'll be rewarded for the fact that you did something genuinely for the sake of Allah. But, if you do an action which is not in accordance with it, then it's rejected. So look, you have to balance it up on the scales. So he says here, na'am. قَدْ يَكُونُ مُتَأَوِّلٌ فِي هَذَا الشَّرْءِ There could be a person who has an understanding which is not correct 
when it comes to the sharia ghufira lahu and he will be excused because of that idha kana mujtahidan li ijtihad alladhi yu'fa fihi an al-mukhti' the person has made a mistake the person has fallen into error wa yuthab aidun ala ijtihadih he is then rewarded for what he thought was doing was correct and Ibn Thaymeen when he he stops at this point and says he goes this is a really important point that a lot of students of knowledge a lot of Salafis don't understand when it comes to bid'ah they're very very harsh and harsh and harsh and harsh but there has to be justice there has to be a balance yes innovation is not accepted is not tolerated and it's one of the major sins as the ulama have mentioned but how do you deal with it and the purpose of it is so that the person comes back towards Ahl Sunnah, not that you drive him further away. Lakin la yajuz or ittiba'uhu fi But it is not permissible for a person to become easygoing and follow him in that, etc. That he has made a mistake. This is because the Shaykh goes on, and I don't want to take too much of your time. The Shaykh goes on and says, festivals are part of the religion. فَالْأَصْلُ فِي الْإِبَادَاتِ أَلْ لَا يُشْرَعْ مِنْهَا إِلَّا مَا شَرَعْهُ اللَّهِ And because festivals are part of the religion, you need evidence for it. And if you have no evidence to say that you are doing this festival, then it becomes a bid'ah. Right. Another important question. What if a person says, well, we are only inventing something into the religion of Islam with good intentions? What's wrong with the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal? That we gather in the masjid and we remember the messenger of Allah because that's when he was born. What's wrong with it? We'll do that every year. What's wrong with that? It's a good intention. And perhaps there might be benefit for the Muslims because people are now coming together and learning about the messenger of Allah without doing something like this. People would not have done it. The Shaykh gives eight answers as to why this is a fallacy and incorrect. Number one, the messenger of Allah وسلم, he used to say, as part of his khutbah, he used to say, Kullu bid'atin dalala. Kullu bid'a, meaning all innovation is a dalala and it's a misguidance, and kullu dalala is finnar, and all misguidance is in the hellfire. Therefore, there is no concept in Islam as a good innovation. Point number one. Point number two. If we have something which is generally prohibited, then even if you want to introduce something which is specific it still falls under what is generally prohibited it's, it might be a little bit complicated but it's a very important usul uh, principle which is if there is a general prohibition but you say okay that is general but i want to do something which is specific from that general can i do it we will say no the generality remains so if a person says the general prohibition here is innovating into the religion a person says I want to innovate something which is specific, which is going to be of a specific benefit. I'm not going to innovate and follow those other people who did lots of bad things. I don't want to copy them. I want to do something which is going to be a genuine good innovation, which is going to be betterment for the community. We will say, no, the prohibition, which is general, remains. Point number, two. Point number three. If we were to say that we can innovate good innovation into the religion, then what does the word kullu bid'at in Dalala mean? What does every innovation what does that mean then that will serve no purpose and the messenger of allah he didn't speak from his desires point number four if we were to allow the opening of the door of good innovation then there will be no end to it and people will innovate into the religion what they want and one person will say no this is good and another person will say no this is good and then there will be no end to it Point number six, people will use that idea of good innovation to start tricking people and changing the religion of Allah. So, Fajr might be a little bit hard. Good innovation, let people rest. We pray Fajr at seven o'clock every single day. Let's fix it. Good innovation. The Sheikh spoke the truth. Wallahi, I even, you might laugh at that. I know of a person in Saudi Arabia he goes Sheikh I've been doing this for years years I've been doing this for years and now I don't know for some reason I feel like asking you I don't know why he felt like asking me he goes I wake up in the morning I have my breakfast I have a shower and everything and that's when I pray for Jah. is that allowed? <laughs> it's not allowed but he goes this is what I've been doing all this time he thought that's, a, that's what I thought it was Salatul Subh Subh is in the morning I pray whenever I want therefore the Sheikh is saying here 
perhaps that's because of a bad innovation that has been introduced to him, or perhaps because there was negligence on his part. But the Sheikh is definitely saying here it will lead to the changing of the religion if we were allowed to allow good innovations to occur. Point number six. The Prophet Sallallahu gave a general prohibition on what is innovated and these all are haram. If we were to say that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said one thing but we will do something else that is bad intentions towards the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that removes the concept of obedience to him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whatever he said Submit now, Allah Ta'ala. We hear and we obey. Number seven. They might even use to argue that good innovations has a precedence. Umar radiallahu started Salat al Taraweeh. The companions collected the Quran. None of these things existed at the time of the Messenger of Allah. So, hey, look, we've got proof for good innovation. Point number seven, the Shaykh is saying here, every single example that you can give of good innovation already has a precedence in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The Messenger of Allah already established Salat al-Tarawih. He stopped it because he feared that it would become wajib. So he left it. But when Umar, by his time, عنه, he gathered everyone and everybody knew that it's not wajib anymore because revelation has stopped. Collecting the Qur'an already began at the time of the Messenger of Allah Wasallam. He had people who were writing the Qur'an for him towards the end of his life Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Jibreel Alayhi Salam used to descend and they used to revise the Qur'an every Ramadan and before Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala took him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam they revised it twice and some of the ulama have said this revision this, the one where it was revised twice were, was presented or people were present who were scribing the Qur'an and they were writing it on parchments and things that they used to have. Therefore, the Shaykh is saying here, there is no idea of good innovation in Islam, and every single example that you can bring already has a precedence in Islam. Point number eight. The Shaykh says here, and this is the point that we mentioned earlier, which is the application of cooperating upon goodness. If a person was to innovate something which is wrong and he calls it a good innovation in Islam the concept of cooperating between good and evil and sin and transgression and bir and taqwa becomes confused and the religion is clear and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left us upon a clarity the shaykh then moves on and this is perhaps the last thing that he talks about in these chapters, the Shaykh then moves on to talk about the types of innovated festivals, and there are two types. One which has no precedence at all in the Sharia, or another one which has a precedence, but they have innovated as an addition to it. And I'll explain what this means. Bid'ah in general is of two types. Al bid'ah al asliya and al bid'ah al idafiya. Al-Bid'ah al-Asliyah, meaning this has no precedence in the religion at all, such as celebrating the Prophet's birthday, such as traveling to places for the purpose of worship, which have not been legislated. People go to different graves and things like that. All of that has no precedence in the Sharia at all. Al-Bid'ah al idafiya are those days which have some kind of dalil to them, but the way that they are applying those evidences become innovated. So for example, we have Ashura. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, min Allah. I hope from Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive the person a year's worth of sins if he was to fast that day. It is a day which is legislated for us to do good deeds. But what they will then do is hold that day, the Rawafid, the Shia and some of the Sufis as well, they add to that day with innovation. This is an example of al-bid'ah al-idafi. 
And he gives an example now of the 15th of Sha'ban, the night of the 15th of Sha'ban. I think it's appropriate that we talk about this right now. He says, وَمِنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ مِنَ السَّلَفْ وَغَيْرِهِمْ There are ulama from the salaf and those who came after the salaf. مَنْ أَنْكَرَ فَضْلُهَا وَطَعْنَ فِي أَحَادِيثُ وَوَارِدَ فِيهَا There are ulama about the 15th of Sha'ban, the night of the 15th of Sha'ban. Many of the ulama have said all of these narrations are weak. لَكِنَّ لِي أَلَيْهِ كَثِيرٍ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْإِلْمِ Rather, there are another group of scholars, and there's a large number of them, أَلَا تَفْدِيلِهَا They say that this night is a virtuous night. Now, what Ibn Taymiyyah is saying here is that the 15th of Sha'ban, even if we were to say that those narrations are sahih, he is putting it under the category of al-bidah al idafi which is, if you were to gather in the masjids, if you were to do anything on that night which has not been legislated, all of that is bid'ah. Just by, and perhaps people use Ibn Taymiyyah here to justify against Wahhabi Salafis about the 15th of Sha'ban as well. Just by Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, accepting that the 15th of Sha'ban with some of the ulama uh, is virtuous, it doesn't mean that that then means that we can create acts of worship on that night. What that basically means is you carry on doing what you're doing. If you've got the habit to stand, then stand. If you've got the habit to fast and it falls on the 16th, then fast. And inshallah, hopefully, you will attain some of the virtues if we were to say that there are virtues. This is basically what he is saying. So he says then, goes on to say, فَأَمَّا الصَّوْمُ يَوْمَ النُّسُ مُفْرِدًا فَلَا أَصْلَ لَهُ This is an example. So he says, if you were to say, okay, 15th of Sha'ban is a virtuous night, and I'm going to specify that night as an act of worship, he says, فَلَا أَصْلَ لَهُ There is no evidence for that. If a person was to say, I'm going to fast the 16th day, or the 15th day, the Shaykh is saying, there is no أَصْل for that. There is no evidence for that. بَلْ إِفْرِدْ إِفْرِدْ بَلْ إِفْرَادُهُ مَكْرُوهُ Rather, specifying that day is مَكْرُوهُ وَكَذَلِكْ إِتِّخَاذَ مُوْسِمًا تَسْنَعْ فِيهِ uh, And likewise, people on the 15th of Sha'ban, they fast and they gather and they believe that this is more powerful than Laylat al-Qadr, etc. He is saying all of that is baseless. This part of the chapter is very important because he is now explaining to us, because we're talking about innovated festivals, he is explaining how innovation works. Some innovations are completely unfounded. And now you can see why some of the ulama have said you need to be stern with these people. You can't cooperate with these people. And you need to give them nasiha. You do it with good manners. وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِينَ أَحْسَنْ Speak to them nicely. Nobody's saying that you'd be harsh with them, but you have to stand your ground and say, no, this is the Sirat al-Mustaqim, and this is the title of the book. The correct passage, you've gone that way. This is the Sirat al-Mustaqim, you've gone that way because of your innovation. And we can't tolerate that. We want you to come back. And we pray to Allah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unites this ummah upon the Sirat al-Mustaqim. This is al-Bid'ah al Al-Bid'ah al idafiya those people who have taken something which has a precedence in the religion, but they've built upon it. Idafa is a building of extra, adding extra to it. The Shaykh is saying here, also these are incorrect. Therefore the Shaykh then ends this chapter by saying that our correct response and our methodology alayka bi adabain is upon you to have two etiquettes. Ahaduhuma, number one, Following the Sunnah of the Prophet accepting it totally, internally and externally. And number two, spread the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, as much as you are able to do so. And obviously, the Shaykh goes on, which we don't have time for, unfortunately. But he then mentions, you know, that a person must do this with ilm and hikmah and sabr and insight and looking at the greater good and balancing against the lesser of the evils, etc. But what the Shaykh has explained for us in this chapter here is that innovated festivals take the same ruling, or perhaps even worse, when it comes to the festivals of the Kuffar. You are not allowed to venerate those days. You are not allowed to exchange greetings on those days. You are not allowed to have any kind of interaction 
with them on those days, but at the same time, like the Sheikh ends with, explain to them the Sunnah, do it in a good manner, explain to them the wisdom, make dua for them, balance greater good with lesser of evils, etc. And the Sheikh also says, in what we have studied today, is that our interactions with the people of Bid'ah has to be placed in its correct category. Some people have got ikhlas and they have slipped. Some people have fallen into Bid'ah al asliya complete, erroneous, there's no precedence for it whatever in the religion. So you need to explain to them. And then there's Bid'ah al afiya and those people are adding to the religion. And again, the same approach, but you at least now understand principally how innovation works. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he shows us Sirat al-Mustaqeem and he keeps us firm upon it. Inshallah, next week will be the last lesson taken from this book where he now then talks about the Sirat al-Mustaqeem and the honor of following Islam and the virtue that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives to his followers. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us from them. Allahu a'lam. Wa sallallahumma ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Yes, of course. Sheikh, you know some people uh, who are innovators, they use this excuse that good bidder, yes. like Umar you know, did 20 rakat, yes. and uh, you know, you're studying Islamic studies, you have these darjat, like you know, classes, system, and then also when you're going for hajj, why, why, do you, why don't you go by walk or by the camel, why do you use a car, how do you respond back to that? How we respond back to, okay, so now you've asked a, a very loaded question, because what you have done now is you've given many examples, but some of them are bidder, Al Asli and some of them are Bida Al Ilafi. So, for example, Umar radiallahu an uh, praying 20 rakats and congregating and creating a congregation for Salat al Tarabi. That has a precedence. So, that's inshallah not a bid'ah. It's not a good bid'ah, it's not a bad bid'ah, it's not bid'ah at all because it's got a precedence. But then, walking for Hajj and creating that hardship upon yourself, going for Hajj has an asal, of course. It's in the Quran, it's one of the pillars of our religion. But going and creating hardship and walking, bid'ah al idafiya So, this is why I was saying here in the lesson, it's very important what the Shaykh is saying here because he's putting down some very important principles. And when you can understand those principles, then you can see how it fits into the actual and then how you can approach the bid'ah that you have seen. And perhaps and sometimes it's not a bid'ah. And as the Sheikh rightly pointed out to us, which is very important, we have to realize that a lot of people, Allah knows best about their interaction with Allah, but there are a lot of people, genuinely, they want goodness, and they've just fallen into misguidance. And inshallah, they will be rewarded for their class, but sabr, wisdom, patience. So that's how you'd explain it to them, and that's how you'd understand it for yourself primarily. Yes. Not here, but in the US, we had a YouTube, YouTube video on what are the good deeds to be done in Islam. He was saying that he was talking about the authentic hadith and things like that, like uh, reading more of Quran, and yeah. fasting during the month of Shabbat. But he also mentioned something about what he meant to say was an authentic hadith about uh, there is in the middle of Shaban, all everyone can be. Forgiven except those who are Mushrikeen, yes. those who uh, cut the ties of kingship. Yes. Is that a, a, a authentic hadith? Uh, the hadith uh, has been attributed to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Allah yunzil fi layl nusfi min al-Sha'ban Allah Subhanahu wa Taala descends on the fifteenth of Sha'ban on the night of the fifteenth Sha'ban and he forgives everyone illa al-Mushrik wal-Mudmin wal He'll forgive all of his creation except for three. The person who does kufr and shirk, the person who is addicted to some kind of intoxication, and the person who has a grudge with his brother. The majority of the ulama have said that this hadith is extremely weak. Some of the ulama, including Shaykh al-Albani, have said that it is hasan. And this is what the Shaykh is saying here. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he is saying here, most of the ulama, have said there is no particular narration which is sahih about the virtues of that night. Some of the ulama have taken it and said, no, we think it is authentic. But, like he said here, if there is a virtue on that night, we then need evidence to say, let's take that night and start doing extra things on that night. If there is no evidence and it becomes bid'ah, 
al idafiyyah And there is no evidence for that. That's haram. But what he is saying here, and this is what seems to be the correct view, is that the ulama said that there is no asl for it at all. So then holding that night would become bid'ah al-asliya. Now when we can understand that, we can now understand how some of the ulama will say, no, there is no virtue on this night whatsoever, completely eradicated. Why? Because they are the ulama who say that there is nothing authentic, so then it falls into the first category, which is al-bid'ah al-asliya. There is no evidence for it at all. But if we were to say that there is evidence for the 15th, the night of the 15th of Sha'ban, and that hadith that you have referred to, and other narrations from some of the Salaf, and some of the ulama of tafsir have talked about uh, the first ayat from Surah Dukhan, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatu mubaraka, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we have revealed the Qur'an on a blessed night. Some of them said that is the 15th of Sha'ban. It's not the correct view. Inna anzalnahu fi laylatu qadr, it is revealed in Ramadan. So if we were to argue and say, go with the ulama who have said, no, the night of the 15th of Sha'ban has some virtue, then the Shaykh is saying, yes, okay, it has virtue. Fair enough. The 10th of Ashura has virtue. Fair enough. But now, in order for you to specify acts of worship on that day, you need evidence. And if you don't have evidence, because bidal idafiyya. So this is very important, because now... In a few days, you'll probably find a lot of messages circulating saying, Imam Shafi, he said you should spend the night in worship and you should make dua and some of the ulama saying this and that. That is because they were doing that already. Do you understand? But if, it, if, if a person is taking that night specific as he has said him said here, Rahimullah, then it becomes makruh to say the least. To answer the question? Barakallah fi. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شن لا إله إلا أنت